Hello and welcome to the show. It's Martin Willis, I'm your host, and I am in uh, uh, New Brunswick. Now I haven't told, uh, I haven't told Stan this yet, but I'll tell you the listeners. Um, I mentioned uh, I was at the Canada border. I gave them my passport, was talking to them, and then they asked me what I was doing, and I said, well, I'm interviewing uh, someone in uh, New Brunswick and Fredericton, and they said, okay, well, what's the interview about? And I said, UFOs. <laughs> and then I was asked so many other questions. They actually made me pull my car over, and uh, I, was, uh, I was detained for quite some time. Uh, kind of looking through to make sure. But I, I, all of a sudden I'm thinking, is it had to do with UFOs? I don't know. But anyway, I am here with uh, the one and only, uh, the one and only, and you know who he is. I have Stan Friedman. Uh, welcome to the show, Stan. Delighted to be with you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for setting this up. Now, we are actually in a conference room in a hotel in Fredericton. And uh, your internet just you just didn't feel comfortable with your internet, and that's fine. Um, so we we made it. Um, I was I, I got to tell you I was sweating when I was at the border because I was watching the clock tick, and uh, so everything's good. Stan, thanks so much. And this show is a tribute to you. Um, it's got our last show together, and I think it's been about ten times that we've. Uh, uh, it's we've been a lot. I, I yeah. don't keep track of these things. Yeah, I know you can't. Uh, if you had to keep track of... I need a secretary, and I don't have one. <laughs> right, right, right. So, Stan, you started back in... What year was it you started? I read Ed Ruppelt's book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, in 1958. And that was only because I was ordering books from Marlboro Books. I needed one more book so I wouldn't have to pay shipping. <laughs> and there was a Ruppelt's book and it was marked down to $1.99 or something. <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't going to cost me anything because otherwise I would have had to pay shipping because for the rest of the order, and that was a lot more than $1.99. So that got me started. I didn't get my first lecture. I'm a little slow on the draw. As a nuclear physicist, you have to be careful what you say. Sure. People expect you to be factual, you know. Yeah. And so I didn't get my first lecture until 1967. And I didn't go full time really until uh, about 1978 or so. No, not 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 that late. But there were a lot of years of speaking before I went full time. the The problem was that I worked in a how will I put it uh, a volatile industry, advanced nuclear propulsion sort of things. Uh, I worked on nuclear airplanes for General Electric. It wasn't a small program. In 1958, we spent $100 million. Wow. We employed 3,400 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. This wasn't six professors sitting around the table, you know. Uh, I worked for uh, the most exciting thing in my professional career, if you will, was working for Westinghouse Astro Nuclear Lab when we tested the NRX A6 nuclear rocket reactor propulsion system out at the nuclear test site, not far from Area 51, you know. <laughs> the thing was this big, power level was 1,100 megawatts. I hate uh, to pay that electric bill. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that was exciting. We listened. The test was done out in Nevada, but we were back in uh, Pennsylvania. And we were listening. Five minutes elapsed, nominal temperature and pressure in 10 minutes. We had no idea how long the thing would last. Nobody had ever done this before. Uh, the exhaust temperature, liquid hydrogen in cold, very cold, and out at 4,000 degrees. That's hot. Amazing. Uh, you know, I guess jet, jet engines usually 1,800 or something like that, you know, and this is over 4,000. So that was so exciting. And then they canceled the program. <laughs> I, I mean, Los Alamos had a slightly larger one, 4,000 megawatts. And Amazing. Aerojet tested one. So here were three very successful tests, all meeting the requirements of the testing. And they canceled the program, because we're not going anywhere. And that was the frustrating thing. Um, you know, and I thought, I, I was headed for the best job you could imagine. They canceled the nuclear rocket program. Uh, 
okay, I'm looking around for a job, sending out resumes, and I knew Dr. Robert Wood at uh, McDonnell Douglas in California. And I got a job offer, and my job would have been to figure out how flying saucers worked. <laughs> Gorgeous opportunity, you know. I don't think I've ever heard this part. Well, uh, <laughs> in other words, how to do space travel. Is that what you're... Well, how to get, uh, yeah, from here to there. But more importantly, I guess, from a McDonnell Douglas viewpoint, they were in aerospace, of course, was how do you zip around in the atmosphere? You zip, 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 you know. And so I'm driving across the country when I heard on the radio that the program manned orbiting laboratory, which I was going to be working under, got canceled. As I'm driving across the oh. country and I walk in, nothing like being greeted with, I show my papers and stuff, you know, I had an offer and all that. Uh, you know, we just laid off 5,000 people. Wow. That's <laughs> the job you just took? The job yeah. I just took. Yeah, they wow. kept me for three months. I could do whatever I wanted. Wow. Uh, well, at so, least you didn't get it by a Twitter. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, and, and it was, you know, I really was looking forward to it because I've been working for 14 years in industry. And so here was a chance to put it all, all the work to use, so to speak. And I was interested in the zipping around in the atmosphere and going to the stars and so forth. Hmm. And so I, the one thing I did that was exciting to me, I did a literature search on magneto aerodynamics hmm. and i found like 900 references which astonished me frankly that so many people were looking into this if you ionize the air around a vehicle in the atmosphere there's a law of physics that says if you got a current moving at right angles to a magnetic field, you get a force at right angles to the electric field that you've generated with the current and the magnetic field. And people actually have built an electromagnetic submarine. Ah. Well, mm -hmm. we don't think of it that way, but seawater is a, an electrically conducting fluid. Mm -hmm. Salt in there makes it electrically conducting. So it's like ionized air. Uh, it looks different and so forth, but they're directly analogous. But you can get around all the problems of high-speed flights. You can control lift, drag, heating, sonic boom production, radar profile, all those good things if you got a plasma ionized air. Now, did, uh, did Mirabeau, was Mirabeau? Leek Mirabeau. Was he one that worked on this? Uh, no, but I knew him. Yeah. Uh, no. it, it, he did some interesting work. I, it's been a long time since I've heard his name, but uh, that was a long time ago. Yeah, Ray Stanford talked about a similarity between an object he saw and what um, Mirabeau was actually working on. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, it was very interesting. So uh, I just want to just uh, clear a couple of things with the people listening tonight. Uh, already we're getting a whole bunch of um, nice messages in the, uh, on the oh. message board. <laughs> uh, 45 minutes or so into the show, we're going to have uh, calls. People can call in and, and uh, wish Stan well and, uh, and thank him for his great work over all these years. And when we get to that time, I will announce it. And also, just basically how to call in, um, I'll tell you how to do that when that time comes. So, Stan, this, um, your career you had, uh, I imagine if you stuck with your career, you could have made a heck of a lot of money. If I've been able to find jobs using my weird talents, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose, but I was never in it for the money. I mean, I worked my way through five years of college. I was a mm -hmm. busboy in the Catskill Mountains, would wow. you believe, for a couple right? of summers. Wow. And I was a, a waiter at a hotel in Chicago while I was going to the University of Chicago. Wow. Yeah. And I worked every weekend, all the holidays. All, uh, it was interesting. I learned a lot about people as well as about food. Yeah, yeah you're right. I've waited tables. I know what you mean. I, yeah. Well, my mother kept a kosher home. Uh-huh. So I'd never seen a lobster before I worked up there, for example, and a lot of other uh, esoteric, seeming to me, uh, food. So uh, the point is, I did work my way through school, and I wanted to work on exciting programs once I started at GE, and it was exciting. And exotic materials, I'd never heard of brillium and brillium oxide, boron carbide and lithium hydride. 
you know, where, where did all this stuff come from? They weren't teaching me about that at the university, that's for sure. Yeah. I was in radiation shielding. Oh. And so you got a, uh, problems. They operate at high temperatures. You worry about weight because you're going to put them in an aircraft to begin with and then in a space system and other things. Uh, you know, uh, and it shocks people when I tell them, when I told you earlier, that uh, the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program at General Electric, 1956 to 1959 I worked, our budget in 1958 was $100 million. Amazing. And we had 3,400 people. And 1,100 of them were engineers and scientists working on aircraft nuclear propulsion systems. So this wasn't a, a few professors sitting around a table jabbering about how nice it would be, you know. We never successfully, op we operated jet engines on nuclear power. Really? Oh, yes, but not in an airplane. I don't understand, uh, you know, for the Ventura and all that, how did, how did well, we won't want to get too techy here, but, uh, but, I, I'd like to ask you after the show how that worked. But well, it's very straightforward. You take cold air in, or normal air, and heat it in the reactor and kick it out through the turbine. Oh, it's heated air. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, the air is all over where you're flying anyway, yeah. <laughs> so that's handy. No, the nuclear rocket had used liquid hydrogen as the propellant, mm. which is a wholly different animal, but is the lowest atomic number element, the lightest weight for cubic foot of propellant, you know. Yeah. And one nice thing about hydrogen, it's all over the place. Right. There's no shortage of it, you know. Yeah. And the moon has hydrogen three, right? Is that, are they supposed it, to? It probably I does, yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, now, Stan, well, I, I guess what I was getting at when I said you could have made a lot of money, um, if you stuck with this particular career, do you have any regrets doing what you, you've done? No. No, no, no. I, I, I go with the flow, <laughs> to use an aerospace analogy. Uh, I, I find challenges everywhere, and everything I worked on wasn't dumb, dumb routine. I mean, the aircraft nuclear propulsion system is not routine. And I worked on uh, spacecraft, compact nuclear reactors, able to produce a lot of electricity, uh, you know, to operate other systems. It was exciting. It was different. No, but I mean, did you have do you have any regrets going into the UFO field from no, your career? No, because well, I, I had a crossover period. Remember, I gave my yeah. I read my first book in 1958. Gave my first lecture in 1967, and went full time in like 79, mm -hmm. and 80. Uh, so what made you decide to go full-time? I needed a job. I had a family <laughs> to support. It was very straightforward. I, uh -huh. I took, yeah. I, I thought I was going to have the keenest job I would ever have wished for. I was hired by McDonnell Douglas, and I, my job would be to figure out how flying saucers worked. Yeah. Now that was a challenge and exciting, and uh, it, it was... Uh, a shock uh, when I'm driving across the country and heard that the program I was going to work on had been canceled yeah. out of the blue, so to speak, literally. <laughs> so, uh, but I'd already given lectures. I've been lecturing for 10, more than 10 years. So I enjoyed, uh, I'm a ham. It's not kosher, but I'm a ham. <laughs> I like yeah. being on the stage. Yeah. Uh, and I've enjoyed. It, it may sound strange, some people, a lot of people suggested, especially early on, that boy, you must get a hard time from people. Well, I don't, I have a question and answer period after every lecture, more than 700 lectures so far. I bet, yeah. And I, I've had 11 hecklers and two of them were drunk. Yeah. That, you're gonna get that many if you talk about anything. Uh, you know, uh, there's no shortage of them. And you know, what I've found, I, uh, the first year I was uh, out uh, full-time, so to speak, I was worried. I was speaking to uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics sections, technical groups, Engineering Society of Cincinnati, Engineering Society of Detroit. These are pros. So you've got to be careful what you say. You know, they won't put up with garbage. Mm -hmm. And they responded extremely well. So I 
was delighted at the response. And, you know, a typical example, uh, <laughs> Gulf Research Labs, technical people, and I spoke, and the first question was, well, I'm sure one could come to other conclusions than the ones you've come to. And I said, well, as I recall now, I talked about five large-scale scientific studies, and I asked how many had read each one, sneaky, uh, and you hadn't read any of those. You remember the, anybody who raised his hand more than once, because it was very rare at that time. Is, is that right? Yes. I said, well, what's the difference between us, isn't it? I gave you my conclusions. I gave you the evidence, the sources, pictures of the covers, uh, the technical data. Uh, and I've read them all. You've read none of them. Whose opinion's worth more? And I shut up. <laughs> silence, mm. long silence. So I have had the opportunity to, with technical people, engineering societies, I haven't avoided, I, I prefer speaking to professional groups, you know, you want to educate them a little bit and you're curious and so forth. And, but I also realized that I, I had a special background in terms of having worked on classified programs. Many people, I've had people tell me, oh, governments can't keep secrets. Oh, yes, they can. Uh, there are leaks occasionally, but remember, there was a mile-long uh, facility built to separate uranium isotopes in secret, a mile-long. Manhattan? The Manhattan Project, mm -hmm. yeah. And there are other, the uh, stealth aircraft was developed in secret. Umpteen billion dollars was spent. So secrets can be kept, and some people don't appreciate that because they haven't worked on it. How would you know? And, and people say, well, of course, you told your wife what you were. I never told my wife anything classified. I'd be crazy to do that. I'd lose my job, could be prosecuted. Do you think some people do, though? I mean, I think very little. I scare the heck out of you, frankly. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, look, one time I had to carry my own slides for a classified presentation at a radiation shielding meeting that was classified. And the courier had already left. My slides weren't ready in time. And they sat me down and read me the riot act. These slides go with you. Not in the trunk of the car that you're driving when you're in a car. They go with you. And if the plane crashes that you're on, we don't care about you. We care about the classified material. <laughs> and you hear enough of this sort of stuff, and I was so glad to get rid of those, because when <laughs> I got there, I had to, you know, I say my slides. They weren't mine. They were classified. And they had to be kept in a storage facility and all the rest of that. So I developed a healthy appreciation for the fact that plenty can go on under security that we don't know of. And some people ask me if I think the flying saucers are R, and I say no, because the number of sightings going back a long ways, the behavior, if we had systems like that, we'd use them in warfare. Right. And when we're spending all that money, you, you, you got to justify it. Yeah. You know, the nuclear airplane, the nuclear rocket, the, all these things. Well, let me just kind of sort of inject this at this um, point. So you were all the way back in the 60s working on some really amazing things. 50s, back, 56 50s. I started. But I mean, but I'm just talking about the technology was really quite advanced, what you're talking about. Do you think now that uh, there's some things that they're keeping secret that are just beyond what we can imagine? Well, I hope so. I, I would <laughs> think so. Yeah. No, really, I think, but... Remember that the big justification was the Cold War. Because mm -hmm. if we don't do it, the Russians will beat us to us and they'll take right. advantage of that and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. The Cold War pressures have eased off some, I think. Mm -hmm. And we've got so much invested in our current equipment, so to speak. Uh, remember, you can't get by building one of a kind of things if you're talking about warfare, airplanes. A lot of young people don't realize during World War II, we had fleets of 300 aircraft bombing in Europe. 300 airplanes mm. dropping bombs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's quite incredible when you stop to think about it. So you got to, it, it's mass production, and it, people wonder, so what's nuclear got to do with anything? Well, let me illustrate that. 
A big bomb in World War II was a 10-ton blockbuster, the energy of 10 tons of dynamite, TNT, whatever. Like Hiroshima and Nagasaki? No, those were nuclear. Oh, oh. Okay, okay, okay. I'm talking about bombing German cities and Japan, oh, Japanese cities. Oh, I'm cities. sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Standard conventional yeah. chemical bombs, I got it. if I got you it. will. Uh -huh. And a big one released the energy of 10 tons of dynamite. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of, make a big hole in the ground, I'll tell you that, knock yeah. down a lot of buildings. Okay, the first atomic bomb, uh, Trinity site in New Mexico, and it happens, but uh, very similar to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, released the energy of uh, 350,000 tons of dynamite. Amazing. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 15,000 tons of dynamite. But the first H-bomb, 1952, released the energy of 10 million tons of dynamite. And the biggest one, the Russians set off Tsar Bomba, <laughs> released the energy of over 50 million tons of TNT. So you go from 10 in World War II. Scary. You know, less than 20 years later. 50 million tons in one bomb. So every civilization out there is going to try to develop nuclear weapons. Now, we know. But you know, we didn't even know there were neutrons until 1932. Hmm. Fission and fusion, the two processes that produce the energy. 1938, we first knew about those. And so you go from 10 to 50 million in less than a generation, really, which is really quite remarkable. And the kicker is all the stars work by nuclear fusion. And I would guarantee you that every civilization is going to ask, how does that star of ours produce its energy? Hmm. It's a mass of burning gas is what we said in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Less than 100 years ago we were still saying that. It isn't. It's a fusion system, if you will. So it, it's important that people recognize that we have learned about fusion. Everybody else is going to want to learn about how their star produces its energy because it's perfectly obvious it's generating a huge amount of energy. I'm not saying there isn't something beyond that. I don't know what it is. but. But we already know enough, in other words, to say that it's extraordinarily more. We want to go to the stars, we know how to do it. If we want to spend the dough, you can go. <laughs> That's my motto. <laughs> well, the base, there's a basic rule here. Technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. Today's computers are not just better slide rules. And I'm sure a lot of people don't know what a slide rule is, but I used one when I was working in industry. <laughs> Uh, you got to change how you do things. So now there's another thing that's changed. It's not only our knowledge of technology that's changed, energy production processes and stuff. But we used to think when Frank Drake, astronomer, talked about listening for signals, SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I say it stands for silly effort to investigate, but because I don't agree with their assumptions. But the kicker is. At that time, he was talking about there might be as many as 8,000 places in the galaxy that could be sending signals. The latest word is that the stars, on the average, have 1.6 planets per star. Think about that. In our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is one of zillions of galaxies, there are over 100 billion stars. So that means 160 billion planets. I'm not saying they're all occupied. But 10% would still give you billions and billions yeah. of planets. And the kicker is that we haven't been around that long. Right. Bishop Usher in the 1650s said the world was created in 4004 BC. <laughs> 6,000 years ago. No big yeah. deal. And now we say the Earth is at least 5 billion years old. So there are lots of planets out there, and people have had plenty of time. I mean, look how short a time compared to the history of the planet. It took us to go from the discovery of the neutron. We didn't know everything around us has got neutrons in it. Mm -hmm. 1932, 
guy got a Nobel Prize for that. It had been there all the time, you understand, but we didn't have the capability of detecting it, of determining that it was there. So in a very short time, we have jumped to being able to put a 50 megaton bomb together. Now, if somebody else got started 10,000 years before we did, or 10 million, what do they know that we don't know? So Friedman's law, progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. Hmm. I get that. We're just, uh, just in just a minute here going to the break. Um, so I will let the people know on YouTube. Um, if you want to post your questions uh, now, a couple of questions in there, I'll ask Stan that, those questions during the break. Um, yeah, so we are ready to go into a break. You're listening to Stanton Friedman, and we're up in New Brunswick, uh, on location, uh, his hometown now, and we're on KGRA Radio, and we'll be right back uh, right after this break. All right, my friend, we're clear. We've got three and a half, a little over three and a half minutes in this break, Martin. Got it, thank you, Race. Um, okay, so let's see if we have any questions that came in um, on the chat room. I know people were asking earlier. Um, someone wanted to know a controversial question I saw come up, and that is, uh, and you probably don't even want to weigh in on this, but what do you think of Billy Myers' photos? That was a question someone wanted to ask you. Phony. Okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> um, and um, let's see. We can, uh, I don't see any, it's gonna take me too long to look through these questions and a lot of, there's so many people that are giving you a, a lot of uh, praise here. And someone says, hey, if you get bored with retirement, uh, uh, I don't know what they're trying to say here. So anyway, um, let's, let's talk um, during this three minute break here. Uh, how did, I'm just curious, and it's kind of a personal question, but what made you decide to move to Canada? My wife's Canadian. Ah, I got it. And we, you could buy a house in Fredericton for half of what we sold our house for in California. Oh, California, yeah. Prices there are so crazy. Yeah, sky, yeah. sky high. And my wife is one of nine kids, and four of them <gasps> were living back here at that time, and their uh, families, and her parents were living here. Yeah. So, uh, family reasons. Uh, I wasn't running away from the FBI, as somebody told me I was. <laughs> oh. I've never regretted the move, I better say. Okay, here's a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, um, let's see, uh, UFOs can't get here from there. They would need to go faster than light? That's a question mark. No, that's wrong. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying they can't, but I don't know how to go faster than the speed of light. But at 1G acceleration, the force of gravity right here, uh, it takes, and I've asked this as a multiple choice question. You don't need to know anything. How long does it take at 1G to get to the speed of light? 1,000 years, 100 years, 10 years, one year. Many people guess, you know, how many think it's 1,000, 100, 10. Many people think 1,000 or 100 or 10. It takes less than a year. So you're talking about a constant G1, like a constant increase? Yeah, 21 miles per hour per second. That's 1G uh, mm -hmm. in rough terms. Uh, I don't want to put in decimal points. <laughs> you know. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, we, that's half an Einstein. <laughs> Einstein said the speed of light's a limit. Uh, the other part is that time slows down as you get closer to the speed of light. How much does it slow down? Well, it depends on how close you get. You go out, come back, and marry your granddaughter's best friend because you haven't aged much. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a very important consideration. And it may sound crazy. Why is it, I, I don't know why that's the way God made the universe. How's that for an answer for a <laughs> nuclear physicist? <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, so that's, um, sorry we didn't get to more questions during this break, but we will later and we will be taking calls later on. Uh, Race, we're ready to go right back on, aren't we? Uh, yeah, we've got 20 seconds. Oh, I miscalculated here, okay. Um, I'm not a, yeah, just a shy number short. Yeah, 
because I don't always count the, the bumper music. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, sometimes, you know, the bumper music made me two minutes and 20 seconds, and I only run 60 seconds of it. So <laughs> yeah. uh, sometimes okay. my figures can be a bit skewed. That's all right. Okay, here we go. Yep. Okay, YouTubers, don't go away. Okay, we've got the bumper rolling here. Stanton, you okay? You all set? I'm all ready to go. Martin, you ready? You bet. Everybody on YouTube, you all ready? <laughs> here we go. In five, four, three, two. All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, my guest uh, tonight is Stanton Friedman. We have a tribute show, a tribute and farewell, and we will be taking calls in about 15 to 20 minutes um, for people who want to call in and wish uh, Stanton well and uh, thank him for his his great, uh, extraordinary work over the years. Um, so, Stan, um, one of the, the questions I thought about asking you is, uh, you, Roswell, do you think that if it wasn't, I, I know how that came about, you've told me the story a couple of times, it's really interesting. Do you think that if you didn't show up at that station that day and there wasn't a delay, and or the guy didn't show up or whatever it was, um, do you think Roswell would have come out eventually? I don't know. I've wondered about that. I see no reason to think it had it. After all, I'm talking about in the late 70s. Right. It happened in 47. Mm -hmm. So it kept been kept secret for a long time. And now all the original witnesses are dead. All of them now? I thought there was one or two, but I, possibly well, by now. The, the, yeah. yeah. May, there may be well, I, there may be ones we don't know anything at all about who are still alive. Yeah, you know. But uh, generally speaking, uh, they died off. And Roswell, yeah, I'm the original civilian investigator, and I'd heard about it twice actually. A woman, uh, a guy who was a forest ranger, told me about a great sighting he had in Cal. I was living in California back then. And uh, he said, you really ought to talk to my mom. She had a great report. She was in New Mexico. So I called Lydia Sleppe, his mother, and tracked down as many people as I could. She couldn't remember all the names and so forth and so on. And I got nowhere, really, in finding other people. She had heard the story that a saucer had crashed and was being shipped to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Hmm. And it was a true story, but I, I didn't have the data to back it up. So then my hearing about uh, the real story, so to speak, that I could follow up on was, again, strictly by accident. I was supposed to do three interviews in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the third uh, interviewer was late. So I'm sitting talking to the station manager, and out of the blue, he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel, a brilliant investigator that I am. I said, who's he? His next sentence changed my life. He, he handled records from one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? Now, how, one thing I always forget to ask you, Stan, and I want you to continue, but how did he know this? He was there. No, no, not, not Jesse. Oh, no. The, the manager. The, oh, the manager and Jesse were ham radio buddies. Oh, and he talked And he had about seen it. the newspaper article in 47. Ah. There were okay. big newspaper, Army finds yep. saucer in New Mexico, ranch in New Mexico. General says it's radar weather gadget, you know. But Jesse was the intelligence officer at the Roswell Army Airfield, named Walker Air Force Base, it became later. And so he was there. And a rancher came in with some crazy wreckage and talked to the sheriff. And the sheriff said he ought to go to the base. And Jesse was the intelligence officer at the base, so he brought his pieces of wreckage there, strange stuff, very lightweight, strong, foil-like material that you couldn't tear, couldn't break, couldn't break through with a sledgehammer and stuff like that and other things. And the base commander ordered Jesse to take one of their, their counterintelligence corps guys and follow the rancher out. He said, there's a whole huge field of this stuff. Fields are big in New Mexico. There aren't many people, there are lots of fields. Mm. 
And so they brought some of it, they followed the rancher out, they came back with it. And that was the end of that. There was big story. The Kenneth Arnold sighting had occurred just a few weeks before. Yeah. The first sighting that got a lot of attention. Mm. Nine objects zipping around in the sky. He timed them, a clock on the dashboard of the airplane he was flying. And they were going more than 1,200 miles an hour. But the speed record at that time was like 700 miles an hour for airplanes. Right. So, yep. you know, this was quite extraordinary. In, in other words, but just so Jesse was the officer at the base who uh, w was the guy in charge of bringing wreckage back in. He wasn't in charge of investigating UFOs. There was no such thing at that time. I mean, nobody with, with that kind of a job. Yeah. But he had the clearance. This is the only atomic bombing group in the entire world. The Russians didn't test their first one until a couple of years later, see? Mm -hmm. So only the United States, and that group was at Roswell Army Airfield. So this wasn't a bunch of GIs sitting around with nothing better to do, make up stories or anything like that. They all had to have high-level security clearances. Atomic bombs, they were the only people in the world who had access to them. They dropped the ones on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm -hmm. and two more in Operation Crossroads. So. Uh, Jesse was pretty special. And anyway, I, I asked him where he lived. He's from Homa. I didn't know where Homa was, Louisiana. <laughs> but I called information, got a number for Jesse, the next day after my lecture at Louisiana State University. And he told me his story. And I followed up on that with Bill Moore. We found 60-some witnesses the first year after that. Wow. Uh, we got, look, you get lucky. Sometimes you get lucky. I called, uh, the, I looked, had a look in an outlet. I said, oh, Roswell, yeah, and looked in a list of newspapers. And Roswell's got a newspaper, the Roswell Daily Record. So I called them and I said, you know, maybe you can help me. I've got these stories here uh, about uh, the group that served at the base there. A guy named Walter Hout put out the the uh, public information. He was the public information guy. His wife worked at the newspaper. Uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. How lucky can you get? Yeah. You know? So I talked to her, and I talked to Walter, and he had been, uh, people think, oh, he was a PIO, public information, no big deal. He was a bombardier during the war, flew more than 20 missions over Japan. And you pick your best, he, including a couple in, the, in some of the tests, and you pick your best guys because at that time, we didn't have a lot of bombs to waste. Right. You, they got to put the, the bomb in the right place for the test, or if you're dropping on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, and so I, I was lucky in, in that sense. And I managed to get a grant. There's uh, a very special guy who has uh, supported a lot of research on UFOs. Uh, and my first grant I got from him, it was the first grant he gave, he's given a lot since. And I was able to go out to New Mexico and there were two bombs, I mean two uh, saucer crashes there, Roswell and the Plains of San Augustine, which is over near White Sands, not too far from White Sands. So when you start talking to the people on the ground, and the thing is that Walter Hout is, knew a lot of the people. He had a base yearbook and he gave me a copy of it. So, you know, oh yeah, I remember Joe lived in Oshkosh and this guy lived here and this guy lived there. And so that was a great help to have somebody who had been there at the time. And, you know, Roswell's a small town. Now it's about the same size as Fredericton, you know, 50, 60,000, something like that. Uh, at that time, it was less than 25,000. But it was a big town for that part of New Mexico, you know. Mm -hmm. And I get a kick out of the fact that uh, the town near where the crash actually occurred wasn't Roswell, it was Corona, mm -hmm. tiny little town. And uh, the first spy satellite was called the Corona Spy Satellite, uh. interestingly enough. Mm. We knew after the U-2 disaster, we knew the Russians would be able to shoot one down because they were able to fly almost as high as we could at that time. 
So isn't it ironic that the Corona spy satellite was developed? And it shows you the, the benefit of being in a military program. There were 12 failures in a row. The oh. 13th one worked and got more data on Soviet military installations than all the U-2 flights that had preceded it. Mm. That yeah. was a Corona spy satellite. And it was kept secret, the, the Corona, yeah. for 25 years. Wow. For those who say you can't keep secrets. Yeah, yeah. So what, we was, did. It, oh, what was it like when you actually interviewed a direct witness? Um, were they right away uh, welcoming your, or, or you know, your interview, or did they? Was it hard to get them to actually talk about it? They were welcoming. They, I mean, I gave them a background sheet and stuff like that. They knew I was legitimate. Look, I belong to the American Nuclear Society, the American Physical Society, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and I only worked for big companies: General Electric, General Motors, Westinghouse, McDonnell Douglas, uh, TRW Systems. So I've got a very respectable background, and they know that, uh, well, universities may hire quacks on occasion, you know, <laughs> crackpots, if you will. But uh, GE and Westinghouse don't have that kind of reputation. If you're good enough to work for them, you must have something on the ball, you know. So uh, people cooperated. I think a number of the people that I talked to, I, I think... They were glad to get it off their chest, the Roswell really? story. Yeah. Yeah. Because they knew the, the, the lies were in the paper. Right. Uh, and how was the consistency of the people? It was very good. Really? That, how they described the materials yeah. mm -hmm. and the properties of the materials and stuff like that. But again, you got guys working for the only atomic bombing group in the entire world. That says something. They didn't hire idiots. I mean, I know having had a clearance for 14 years that uh, you got to have it on the ball to get hired to work on something very classified. Right. And in other words, you, you don't walk in from outside, hey, I'd like to see where they make the nuclear bombs or they load them or anything like that. It doesn't work that way. You don't have access. So I found that people were relieved to be able to talk to somebody that they felt they could trust. And they recognized, I mean, the cat was out of the bag, so to speak. So they were not, I, I know some people were in fear because they were threatened, right? Well, there were people in the early days who'd been told to keep their damn mouth shut. Mm. And no question about that. And, but that had to do with all kinds of classified things. All the guys who worked at the base had to have a clearance. Mm -hmm. You didn't just walk in off the street and get access because you might walk around and see something that was classified even if you weren't working with it. There are plenty of people working at the base. It's like at Los Alamos. Thousands of people work there. Mm. And you have to have a clearance because you may be exposed or hear somebody talking or whatever. So security has a long arm and gathers in people and information and threatens the heck out of you if you ever open your mouth. Uh, so when, when the uh, government said that this was, you know, weather, a weather balloon. You with know, the, the radar first, reflector. With the radar reflector. But when they first, when they first said that. Um, Nobody you, argued with it. And, and not even the witnesses. No. So they basically had this out of their life or whatever until yeah. you know, it started being investigated again in the By me, in the 70s. Right, right. Um, and what about, the one thing that's confusing is about the supposed pod that crashed separate. There um, seemed to have been the bodies recovered a couple of miles from where the wreckage came down. So a crew compartment would not be surprising. We talk about crew compartments on spacecraft, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, you know, the first, certainly the newspaper coverage in 1947 didn't say anything about bodies or anything. Like. General says it's radar weather gadget. Army captures flying saucer on a ranch in New Mexico. 
general says it's a radar weather gadget. Who was going to argue? Now, did you actually speak with any witnesses that said they saw bodies? Did you personally speak to anyone? Uh, Glenn Dennis was as close as I came. He was the mortician at the base, and he had heard about them. He was asked about small caskets. Can you get small yeah. caskets? And he says, well, you can if you, because you've got to bury children once in a while. You know, so undertakers, he was knew about such things. But the people, people weren't running around shooting off their mouth. Hey Stan, come and talk to me. It wasn't like that. I had to find them. And oh, sure, I'd ask everybody I talked to, like Walter Hout, do uh, you know anybody else? What I was looking for was people who were at the base at the time. It's a big base. And uh, in a small town like that, people get to know each other. You know, this isn't the big city. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all <laughs> for Roswell. And the base is, was just, uh, what, nine miles south of town. Okay, um, so I am going to, uh, for some reason I can't get our call-in number coming up there. Um, so, uh, and uh, I am going to uh, open the phones up if people would like to call in and wish uh, Stan well. I'm trying to get the number up there right now, um, but uh, this number is only good during the live show, and for some reason this is just not showing up like it's supposed. I see it right there, but I can't get it to shift over. Um, so that call-in number is 603-967-4030. Uh, if anyone would like to call in, you're welcome to call in and wish um, Stanton well. Uh, now, how that's going to work basically is... Uh, if you're listening live on YouTube, of course, or KGRA Radio, um, you're going to have to mute your. Um, you're going to have to mute or turn down your speakers down really low, so there's no feedback coming through. And I'll take calls, and uh, you'll be on hold until I introduce you. Um, I can only take one person at a time, so um, you'll have to be patient in calling in. But you're welcome to call in now, and uh, hopefully, I'll be able to figure out the call-in number that back here uh, to put it up on the screen again that number is 603-967-4030 for anyone that would like to call in um, all right um, so um, they'll probably call in more in the second hour um, so in your your career um, in this field I would say that your your that's your biggest contribution. It have to be. I mean, Roswell. Yes. I mean, you, it's on the map. Uh, I, I bet. The, I bet even the town has more of a population because of it. Well, the, the the museum, International UFO Museum and Research Center in Roswell, last year, you know, the year actually the year before last, it had two hundred and twenty thousand visitors. Whoops, uh, listener, you're gonna have to turn up, turn off whatever it is, make a noise. Hang in there. I no no. Hang in there, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, last year, the museum had over two hundred and twenty thousand visitors. This is in a town of uh, less than fifty thousand. That's outside. amazing. Yeah, and, it, and you, if you were there, you got to want to be there. It's it, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's right. two hundred miles from Albuquerque. It's two hundred miles from Amarillo. It's two hundred miles from El Paso. You know, so it's not on the way by to any place. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So that shows the interest. And they come from all over the world. No question about that. Yeah. Just as I've spoken in all 50 states. All 50 all states. All 50 wow. states, 10 <laughs> Canadian provinces, and 19 other countries. Don't tell me that people aren't interested. I know yeah. they are because I've been out there. All right. So, we, uh, caller, what's your first name and where are you calling from? Um, my first name is Daniel, and I'm calling from Mount Pleasant, Texas, or I'm from San Antonio. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I'm trying to crank the volume down here a little bit. Um, so do you have a, a comment or a question you'd like to ask, Dan? I have a question more about the procedures on keeping secrets, and I wonder if Stan would know about analyzing secrets, uh, because keeping your mouth shut, that's part of the problem. That's not part of the problem, that's part of the how it is. And it seems to me that in his, I want to ask, in his research, 
have you ever came to the conclusion that you're that the phenomenon doesn't want you to know about it about the about UFOs in general not just UFOs but the paranormal in general and I'll take my comments off the air thanks for the call well of course I haven't spoken to any aliens and I haven't spoken to somebody who says, uh, yeah, I'm well aware of all the secrets and this, that, and the other thing. I, we, we don't get that kind of inside information. Uh, but I, I think the, the aliens are here for their purposes. They know we know they're here. After you've been tracked on radar umpteen hundred times from the ground and from the air, and who's got the radar? The government has the radar. You and I don't have our own little radar set. Let's set up a radar set and see if we can track any of these UFOs. That would be neat, but we don't, we're not in that position. So there have to be some few people in government, and uh, there's another misconception. Some people think, well, if you've got a top secret clearance, you have access to all top secret material, right? Wrong. There are two parts. You got, have to have an appropriate clearance, and you have to have a need to know I mean, I worked on radiation shielding for nuclear airplanes. That did not give me access to classified Q clearance uh, atomic secrets, if you will, from other programs. Sorry, you don't have a need to know. Right. But I have a clearance. That's not good enough. And somebody makes those decisions, in other words. So it's a, a double layer. You got to pass through the sieve in the first place to make sure you're a decent, honorable, trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. And secondly, you have to have a need to know, and somebody has to certify that. I went through this when I visited on business uh, Los Alamos and other classified facilities. My company had to send information about my clearance to those people, hmm. and they had to accept it. I mean, if they didn't accept it, I couldn't visit there. Huh. So it, it, it's not a simple question you know, uh, no, it's difficult. Need to know is very important. Yeah, yeah, I can see how that works. All right, we have another caller on the line. Your first name and where are you calling from? Uh, Robert Williams in Morris, New York. Hi, Robert. Uh, no, it's, hi, uh, Stan, good to hear from you. I'm sorry to hear you're retiring. Hey, I'm 84. Uh, what do you expect? <laughs> I'm 166. So you got a I'm ways to go, there. man. <laughs> I I hope to make you 84, but I, I I'd enjoyed your visit to Clint Community College in Blacksburg State, and I'm I'm reading your book Top Secret Magic again, this time right now at the moment, and I just got this email that this live YouTube is up, and I just had to call in and, and say hi and congratulations. I mean you're still alive, right at 86, so. 84. I, I, 84. <laughs> well, I, I have hope for another uh, 20 years myself then. <laughs> Good. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping I can get Musk. Uh, to, uh, he is going to land at, at the Latitude in Cydonia. And uh, I'm, any, any book that, you, that Stan Friedman writes, there's flat facts in there. Okay? There's brutal truths. And it is hard to get through the different layers. It really is. I mean, and Top Secret Magic is one of the books that shows how you have to go into the details of which typewriter was used and, and something like that. And it, it is true. If you don't have a need to know, even presidents don't get full briefings. I think probably the last full briefing was Eisenhower. So I know Kennedy didn't get one. <laughs> You didn't live long enough. But oh, okay. uh, all, all, all the books that the Stanton Freeman has has, I have. And the only thing I've, I've asked him for that he's never given me is those 500 black pages. <laughs> that is what it's, <laughs> it's for you. And so, I mean, I'd like to be able to just flip through those things on, on a commercial <laughs> if I win the publisher's clearinghouse. Uh, right. But that'll never happen, like being abducted. <laughs> I haven't even seen a UFO, so I'm a step behind you. you know? Well, I haven't seen, I haven't really seen one either. My father did, but he, he said, uh, you know, so I haven't seen one myself, but uh, 
I, I know they're there, you know, with, with everything else and all the videos that are out there and all the books I've read that you've wrote and, uh, and uh, Powdy, uh, The Day After Roswell. Uh, you know, that one Air Force guy was one that definitely stepped forward and had the cojones to tell the truth. And, and, and thank God for, for people like him. And, and, like, and like you discovered, uh, Blue Book Special Part 14. I mean, uh, if you're holding that up now, I mean, that right there uh, in 14, there's no way anybody, if it's brought up, can debate it. It's like 9-11. You can't debate that that thing came down, a uh, 110-story building came down in 15 seconds without explosives. I mean, you're a physics guy. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this can't happen. You know, science is, is science. And uh, you can't make a left-hand turn and a right-hand turn unless you're inside the center of gravity. All right, well, but, uh, we, we that, actually that, have to... That have Project to... Blue Book 14, if that was asked to the, the, the State Department, I mean, or the, the, D, the DODA, NASA, uh, or even Donald Trump, he would not, they would not be able to explain... Uh, special report 14 without saying that yes there are extraterrestrials here and yes they are abducting people and there's also a race of them that look like us all and right i'm sorry but we're we're, we're, <laughs> we're we're running late for the break we have to go into break uh thanks so okay. much for the call yep and, and good luck stan and Thank you. i hope to be able to get in touch with you again someday i hope so too i hope i'll still be around and be talked to <laughs> been nice talking to you thank all right, so it's time for our break. Um, this is Martin Willis on Podcast UFO, and we're on KGRA Radio. And hang in there. We'll be right back. All right, Martin, we're in the clear. Forgive me, the cleaning staff is here, running vacuum cleaners and everything else. That's okay. <laughs> but we've just, uh, almost four minutes in this break. Okay, good. All right. Um, sorry about the feedback. I, there's really nothing I can do right now to stop that. Um, so it's not real bad? No, no. It just it happened there in just one little short period. So. Oh, okay. All right. Because I turned the computer a little bit, hoping it would deflect it a little bit. All right. Um, thank you. Okay, so now we have this break here. Let me just pull up to see if we have any questions um, that people wanted answered. And uh, what about... The Skinwalker, that movie just came out. I wondered, have you looked into that at all? It's on my list of books to <laughs> to yeah. get. I haven't looked into that really. Yeah, it, I know George Knapp though. Yeah, he's a great who, guy. Yeah. And a very solid reporter. Yeah. I mean, we don't always agree on things. Yeah, and we're probably going to talk a little bit about Bob Lazar. Yes, that's one <laughs> of the people we don't agree about. Yeah. But. Uh, I have the greatest respect for George. He's, I do too. He's very yeah. knowledgeable. I've been interviewed by him. I've spent some time with him. Yeah. And uh, really good man. Top notch. Yeah. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I was reading something today in, in the MUFON Journal, I think, about the Skinwalker Ranch and something like that. I've got to get the book. I don't have the book. Yeah. Um, so the, vi the video just came out um, on the 11th, I think it was. And uh, that is a video that. Uh, Jeremy Corbell did using um, a lot of George Knapp's original footage from 25 years earlier, I think yeah. it was. Um, he, he's a big fan of uh, Lazar, incidentally. Jeremy yes, he is. is. Yeah, he's got a film coming out in December. You know, we have a call coming in now. We have, I don't know exactly how many minutes, but why don't we take the call um, since we're on break. Um, caller, can you hear me now? Can you hear me, caller? Yes. All right, your first name, where are you calling yes. from? I'm um, Robert, and I'm calling from California. Hey, Robert, how you doing? So just to let you know, we only have two minutes here in the break, so if we can wrap it up in the two minutes, that'd be great. So go ahead. Yeah, you have a question I'm just going to ask comment? him. Yep. Okay. You want me to ask the question now? Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, Stanton, um, George Easley, Isley, he was the last link to... FDR and Truman, he died um, not too long ago. I, I'm the one that sent you the email from California that he was just like one city over from me in Tustin, California. And um, 
and he was like the inner circle, if I remember you stating, uh, but you felt at the time he didn't know anything. I think you, you said that you had interviewed him. He was a naval officer, but uh, I was just wondering now that there's some time has passed, do you think he may have known something about Roswell? What was the last name? Isley? Elsie? Elsie. E-L-S-E-Y. Oh, -E George Elsie. Yes, I talked to him, as a matter of fact, and I was very favorably impressed. He was a Navy ensign for many years, uh, and he was very helpful, and I was uh, pleased to find firsthand sources like that. I mean, he was in the military. Uh, I, I appreciated uh, you know, I, I've had the good fortune of talking to lots of people that I had the greatest respect for. Uh, right. the, the World War II was a major event in man's history, and most of the guys I talked to had been in the war, or, or soon thereafter in the military right. and stuff. So I was very impressed. And George Elsie is one of the, as a matter of fact, his picture is in uh, one of my books, I think. I think I'm actually going to have to Did cut you, cut so you don't, so so he, he told you that he did not have any information about Roswell or right. okay, one we, of the other crashes you've written about? Right. You're going to have to hang in there. Maybe we can somehow bring this uh, conversation into. Uh, we have to go. Uh, oh. The break's over, okay. so just hang in there if you would. Uh, the reason why. The reason no, no, why no. You I have to stop. You have to stop. Actually... You have to stop talking, please. Stand by. Carl. Okay, I'm Stand sorry. By. Stand, no worries. You, you're fine. Stand by. Um, and we'll get you right back on here. Here we go, Stanton. Here we go, Martin. In five, four, three, two. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. My name's Martin Willis, and I'm with Stanton Friedman up in New Brunswick. And uh, we're talking all kinds of things. We just, in, during the break, um, a name came up, and, uh, and uh, we have a caller on the line now. So... If you would, uh, can you kind of, in a nutshell, uh, talk about this situation? We can bring the caller back in. Which situation? Um, I, Esley, or whatever his name is. George Elsie. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, well, I, I, I called the Truman Library. I've been to uh, 20 archives because I think you need to get firsthand information. And uh, the Eisenhower Library, the Truman Library, the Kennedy Library, and a whole bunch of other places. And I asked the Truman Library, uh, this is a number of years ago, was there anybody still around who, you know, was at the White House in, in the 40s when Truman was president and stuff? And they mentioned George Elsie. And they told me how to find him, which I did in D.C., and so we were talking about things like uh, James Lay, who was the executive secretary of the National Security Council. And here's a guy, uh, Elsie served at the White House. How can you not listen to somebody like that, you know, during this time frame? He's dead now. But uh, so I did uh, talk to him. I was very favorably impressed. And uh, I, I had so many people that I talked to, like Elsie, who had sufficient background so that you could not knock them down as, oh, he's a nobody, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he wasn't there, that sort of nonsense. Uh, I check out people, I ask for credentials, I look to see forms, you know. If there's one thing the military does, it has forms all over the place <laughs> and documents. And so, uh, he was a Navy ensign, and he, Elsie was very helpful in uh, offering information about how the things worked at the White House. And things like, you know, if you get guys who were there, I had somebody say one of the documents that I say is genuine, uh, and Phil Klass, uh, who was a big debunker, paid me uh, $1,000 for proving him wrong about uh, documents. Uh, and I was able to get other documents. And one thing George agreed with, Elsie, was that the government isn't always consistent. Not everything has the same typeface back then. People used typewriters before the computer age back in the 40s and 50s and stuff. Uh, Roswell was 1947. Uh, 
so uh, it was good to talk to people who were on the scene and who could say, yes, that's just exactly, of course, uh, somebody was out of the country at the time. Would James Lay, the National Security Council guy, have been involved in doing something? This is during the Eisenhower era. I, and so, I was just wondering now that you have uh, uh, time to reflect, do you think that he may have known about Roswell? He might have known a little bit, heard something from somebody, scuttlebutt, if you will, as they used to call it. And the reason why I say that, uh, Stan, is that d during a second interview, he showed the reporter top secret documents of the Truman doctor Doctrine, which apparently, you know, I mean, whatever the special words for not having these papers, well, he had them in his house, uh, in his, hidden in uh, some sort of library cabinet. So that got me to wondering. I wonder what else he may have um, had I don't or know. had. Or, A anybody yeah. who's listening who has some documents that they'd like to show somebody that they think they can trust and who's going to die anyway pretty soon, <laughs> I I'd like to hear from them. I'm in Fredericton, New Brunswick, yeah. Canada. I'm in the phone book. You can look me up on I the internet. I'm just wondering if you, if, you knew, if you knew any of his family members because that was the other thing, the caveat that I sent you in the email, that he actually let the reporters see this document of the Truman Doctrine that he actually kept from the White House, which I'm sure he wasn't supposed to keep. But, you know, of course, back then, as you know, uh, and my dad was also in the Air Force uh, SAC, Strategic Air Command, and he actually, five, he actually told me one day uh, that he saw five saucers out at uh, Hunter Air Base in Georgia. Savannah, Georgia. It's not there anymore, but I don't know if you're aware of, a Army, of an Army Air Corps base called the Hunter Air Base. He said it's coming out of the latrine, walking towards his uh, bomber. As I believe they kept the, uh, also atomic bombs there, maybe, or at least uh, some sort of the wing, uh, winged, uh, you know, B-52s there at Hunter Air Base. And he said he looked up and he saw five discs uh, circling around like a... Um, merry-go-round. This is like back in 1953, and I just want, that was another thing. I mean, I know I'm off the topic, but I was the one that sent you the email that he had passed, and it was in the Orange County Register, and then I thought, well, maybe he had contact with the family to see if he had any hidden things that they discovered, especially anything re pertaining to Roswell or the other crash that you uh, found. Was it Corona? Well, no, Corona was really Roswell. Uh, the other was the Plains of San oh, okay. Augustine, which is yeah, west, I, I, west I meant of there. Uh, well, I'm just kind of I'm kind of late to the party, uh, 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 Stan. I, you know, I've seen you many times on, the, especially back when they really had news programs such as the Real Nightline <laughs> and Larry King, and of course now it's uh, it's like uh, cotton candy. So you know, I mean, uh, but. No hey, fluff for uh, me. <laughs> I want to shout out from Southern California. Have a great retirement. Have some fun. Are you going to be uh, popping up still once in a while? Because I, I just don't, can't see you sitting around. Well, you know, I've, I've uh, got a couple more eating, lectures uh, to give. I'll be in South Carolina at the end of the week. Oh, okay. And I got two in California. Okay. Uh, three next year. Uh, I'm, the 50th right. anniversary of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. They have an annual symposium, and it'll be in Irvine, California, in the summer, oh. early July of okay. 2019. Well, that's where that's where I live, so I'll have to come out and personally see you. Okay, good. <laughs> I right. hope I'm hey. still around. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, yeah, I'm the one that you owe me money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, thanks for the call. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right, Martin. Hey, great. Thank you, thank you. Sorry for the cutoff there a little bit. Hey, um, just to let people know, this is not, uh, this show here is not the official Stan Friedman retirement show. This show is one that I am doing personally um, for my show since I've had to stand on at least 10 times. Um, so this is my farewell. Um, I wanted to make sure that I saw Stan in person and was able to do this. So I'm not saying that Stan is retiring tomorrow. You'll never see him. But I will say that this is my uh, farewell show to him and tribute to him. And, uh, and I personally 
will say at the end, but um, I think uh, Stan has done so much for this uh, for this field in so many different ways. And um, thank you. Yeah. And um, speaking of that, what do you think the future is? Do you do you find that there may be another Stan Friedman that may evolve? Are you hoping for that? Well, there are people like John Greenwald, yeah, you who's that only last in time. his 30s. Yeah. And uh, so he's got, and he's done more, he's got the Black Vault website. Yeah. He's collected more darn documents than you can imagine. So I think there will be others. And there's also, one of the things that's changed, it's the thing I mentioned earlier, the perception that there are so many planets now that we didn't know about, that we didn't think were there. We thought planets were rare. The Earth is unique, kind of. Mm -hmm. We thought we're on the top of the heap. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't believe it for a minute, but uh, <clears throat> the perception of that has changed. So I expect a couple of things are going to happen. Somebody is going to decide that it's time for the world to know about this. Uh, they've been covering up the cosmic Watergate, I call it, for a lot of years. Uh, secondly, I think there are going to be people who may have kept some documents and will make them public because they're in their 80s or 90s and what the heck, you know, it, it's time. The public is ready for it. Now, look, if you talk to people back then about having 1.6 planets per star, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It really is as, as a notion. They're, they're all over the darn place. We didn't think that. Look, 8,000 8, planets we thought might be out there sending radio signals. And we're talking over 100 billion planets in our galaxy alone. That's not counting the other galaxies. And that may be a low figure. Yeah. Possibly. Um, we, we don't, because colonization and migration, nobody talks about that. I mean, look at Canada and the United States back uh, 500 years ago. Weren't many people around those places, you know? That's right. Uh, and as time has gone on and people saw oh, what a wonderful place, I'm living in Canada now and I think I'm a dual citizen. I, uh, you know, God save the queen. Uh, so what, what I'm saying is our perception of our significance has changed. And now, I don't know whether the churches of the world have gotten together, but it was once a question asked of the Pope, and somebody, I think it was the Pope, made a comment about uh, if God made them, there's no reason there can't be life uh, all over the place out there. It was a sort of enlightened comment. Yeah, he also wanted to baptize them. Well, <laughs> as yeah. if they'd want to be. But anyway, uh, we so, have. Oh, is there anyone there? We have a caller. Yes, uh, for anyone that's calling into the show, what happens is uh, you're going to have to uh, be on hold until. You... Is that a dog? Do we have a dog in the room? <laughs> uh, welcome to the show, caller. Uh, what's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name's Lewis Ferrier, and uh, I'm calling from Alaska. Hi there. I welcome to the show. Question, um, um, for Stanton, uh, do you have any idea what uh, reverse osmosis uh, non-ionizing radiation is? Well, no, that's a process used to desalinate water, as far as I know, I, where you put uh, pressure. The in... reason I was go on. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, the reason I was wondering is one of the people who was in Middleton Forest, um, the U.S. government paid him off because he was exposed to this type of radiation off in, supposedly in the forest and uh, took care of his uh, injuries and stuff like that. I was just wondering uh, what this process was and, uh, you know, uh, how did they relate that to radiation? I, I don't know. That, that's a unique one on me, and I, I certainly don't know. I know a lot about neutrons and gamma rays and beta particles, maybe. Uh, but uh, look, there are radioactive materials all over the place, uh, a lot more in some places than others from Mother Nature. That's forgetting about yes. the one from, that man has produced, you know, the cobalt-60 source that got lost someplace, and ouch. <laughs> <You know. laughs> 
All right. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, I sure a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, I've been a fan of yours since the beginning. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks for the call. Thank you very much, sir. All right. So, everyone, just to let you know, if you're calling in, um, I'm not going to pick up right away. What you'll be is you'll be on hold. You'll be able to hear us talking, and then I'll introduce you. So just hang in there and make sure that your volume's down on your computer or however you're listening um, to the show. So uh, we will take calls. Uh, that number's up on the screen. For those of you at KGRA Radio, um, that number is 603-967-4030. Um, you can call in um, and either thank Stan for his work or ask him a question. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you, Stan, was in this whole time that you've been involved in this field, what do you think is the most important step that's happened besides the planets? I think the most important step is that many more people have come to realize that we're not in the center of the universe and that our technology is undoubtedly not the most advanced in the neighborhood, so to speak. Uh, and we've taken ourselves off the pinnacle, the middle of the universe, you know. Wow, look at us. Uh, and it hasn't taken, it's only a few hundred years. You know, uh, first flight was 1903. Amazing. How much has changed? Oh. In such a short time. Yes, and, and I'm impressed with that because I know that progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. It's that last part that bothers people. They think things go in a straight line. No, the transistor is not just a small vacuum tube. <laughs> I hope people remember vacuum tubes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Um, so do you think also, I had you on the show right after the December 16th, you know, the Pentagon, released the New York Times article that yes. came out. And, um, and at that time, you were saying you wish you were young uh, again when that started. Um, well, what, do you think, what do you think about since the last time we talked about that? I, I'm rather disappointed. I mean, here you got some very impressive people uh, talking about a program that was secret for years, many years. And which, it was a small amount that was spent in that particular program, 22 million dollars, which is nothing. Right. But uh, I think that uh, we're heading in the right direction. I think there's going to be a lot more. I think a lot more has been spent that we don't know anything about. But people shouldn't be surprised that just because we've made a lot of advances, which we certainly have, that we're at the ultimate. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the end of the road. That's not the way things have worked. That over and over again, people have thought, that's it. You know, yeah. uh, the great astronomer uh, right around the turn of the 19th century said if there was one thing he was sure of, man would never fly any distance in a vehicle. That's right. And that was two months before the Wright brothers' first flight. That's right. Yeah. And remember, the Wright Brothers' first flight was like 40 miles an hour for a short yeah, distance. 300 you know? yards or something. Uh, oh, yeah. less than that. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, it would yeah, it fit inside a B-52. <laughs> That's right. I remember seeing that diagrammed. Um, no, yeah. So uh, things have happened a lot more quickly than would have been expected. Right. Now, some people have suggested, well, that means we've had help from the aliens. Why would any sensible alien give any technology to earthlings. We killed 50 million people in the past century in yeah. wars. 20th century was the worst on record, really. Yeah. Yeah. 50 million people. I mean, uh, it's just hard to believe. Yeah. It's not something to be proud of. Right. Right. We, we have another caller and other people just be patient. I'll I'm taking calls one at a time. Sorry. So I'm trying to call in now. Uh, caller, what's your first name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is John from North Carolina. Uh, hi there. How are you? You have a question for Just or fine. a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, Stanton, thank you for all the work you've done. Uh, it was a yeoman's work. I've, I've always enjoyed um, seeing you over the decades, and uh, you're to be uh, congratulated and honored. I um, actually did one of the first stories after you and Bill Moore uh, did your initial 
study with um, uh, Roswell. I was working on a search of at the time, and we went out and did a UFO government cover-up story. And we, we interviewed Jesse Marcel Sr. and got his, his take on everything. And coincidentally, I actually uh, had worked with uh, and for Jamie Chanderay. Oh, and yes. Years ago, and, a, and a, I've kind of lost track of Jamie and, and all that, but I was pretty active in the whole field back in, uh, this would have been in the early 80s. I actually, um, uh, as an ABC field producer, I actually uh, was doing a UFO story up in Wyoming and, and actually had a sighting and got, got a film of it, and it was, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty interesting and very uh, shocking when, when it, my cameraman and I saw it. It just uh, it, it changed my life. Do, do you know what uh, what Jamie's doing now, or whatever happened? Because I remember talking to him. He was a bit coy about answering me when we discussed things, and I just wanted to respect his privacy. But he kind of uh, it was like he was working on something special. I think that you know he and uh, Bill, and they were, and you probably were involved with it at the time. And then it just kind of it just died off in, uh, in the '80s, and it didn't go anywhere. And then Bill had his little thing. Anything I, I, you can add to that? I would. I, no, I haven't had any contact with Jamie or Bill Moore, for that matter, for more than a decade, I'd say, as a general rule. Uh, we worked together for some period of time, uh, digging out witnesses. And matter of fact, Bill and Jamie, uh, Jamie was a Hollywood TV producer, uh, uh, wanted to make a big special movie and book and the whole can of worms, if you will, as it turned out. Right, right. And it didn't go anywhere, really. I was disappointed about that. Uh, we had philosophical differences, but they did work hard in those early days. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I did spend a lot of time with Jamie and Bill, uh, and I haven't heard from either one of them, like I say, in almost a decade. Well, I remember Bill telling me in conversation that, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said that uh, he had gotten in, uh, an inquiry from 60 Minutes, uh, and he didn't really, I guess, didn't want to uh, go forward with that. Um, but, but So it was kind of momentum was going, and, uh, and then it just died, so it was interesting. But I can tell you, I, I saw uh, and had an experience on... Um, on a gentleman up in, in Wyoming, which coincidentally is only, he lived about 60 miles as the crow flies from uh, A.E. Warren uh, Air Force Base, mm -hmm. which has uh, it's a nuclear miss missile field up there. And uh, they've had shut down missiles in the 70s. And this was, uh, this gentleman's experience took place over about, about a decade. And, and we saw this stuff and uh, I can, I can confirm that there's something very deep going on. Well, I, I think if anybody wanted to spend the effort, they could mine the old data before everybody dies. <laughs> In other words, if you made a, a major effort to get people who have knowledge to come forward, uh, I think you could gather a lot of data. People who were in a position at a radar installation or in an airplane I mean, there, there are some spectacular cases involving airplanes and a whole crew seeing UFOs flying, circling around the airplane. Uh, what are you supposed to say about these people? You're trusting them with nuclear weapons, uh, yeah. and you say you don't believe what they say about seeing a darn old flying saucer or two of them or five of them or right. whatever. That, that's nonsense. So, and there, there's a big, couple of big oceans out there, too. And the Navy has stayed away from this subject very loudly. <laughs> and I, I don't know how they got away with it. Why haven't the press gone after Navy people? Because there certainly have been sightings by guys on board aircraft carriers and destroyers and so forth. It's right. a big ocean. Yeah. Also, remember, we have nuclear-powered submarines and nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. and. I'm still impressed by the fact that a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier can operate without refueling from someplace close to 25 years. Somebody told me 30, but I'll say 25. What the heck? That, that's terribly impressive. And submarines, in World War II, U-boats, 
could stay under for about a day. Now they can go around the world underwater, Amazing. which right. is truly incredible. But I think that's what's kept the peace. Because we know well, I, that if somebody drops a bomb on us, an ICBM or stuff, we can retaliate with submarines that he doesn't know where they are. That yeah. means you're almost invulnerable. You're protected by those huge oceans. And so we don't have a good way of detecting submarines. You know, the enemy can't find our submarines. Oh, they're right here, there, and no, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, the, the nuclear systems have been important, and I think there certainly are plenty of sightings by, of UFOs near nuclear installations. Mm -hmm. And you can understand well, why. Can Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, uh, real quickly, I have a, another uh, you know, ancillary story, but so do you remember, you remember the, uh, the, uh, the Invaders show back in the 70s? Yeah, it was the 70s, yes. the ABC TV. Vaguely. Okay, so I, I, so uh, Roy Sinis is the actor, and I, I actually had talked to him. He, he, I was working on a, a UFO show at the time, and him and I, I happened to meet him at a conference. And so I talked to him um, about what I was working on, and he said, this is what he said to me. This is, this is, I, I can tell you exactly what he told me. He said, well, you know, that's interesting. He said, when I was working, uh, and he was like the lead in this, this show, and he said, when I was working on that program, and it, only, it lasted, I think it was maybe three seasons at the most, and he said, I got a call from uh, Air Force personnel, and he said, you know, the guys that fly in those bombers, uh, you know, they're in the 60s, and I said, oh, yeah, the Strategic Air Command, and he goes, yeah, he goes, I was contacted by, I believe he said it was a captain. And he said, the captain wanted to come and talk to me. So, uh, and I said, about what? And he said, about this experience that, that he had had. So they, they got together. And the captain in, proceeded to tell him that they were on, <clears throat> they were on one of their global missions where they've got nuclear weapons, they're flying, so they're on, you know, alert at any time. And there's, all, there's always a bomber or a series of bombers in the air in the old days in the Cold War. And he said that their B-52 was being tra tracked and trailed a few miles back by these objects. They could see them on the radar, and they just trailed them for hours. And then Roy told me, he said, and then over the intercom, and I'm just telling you what he told me. He said, over the inter the, the this Air Force guy told Roy that over the intercom came a voice, and essentially... It was, you shouldn't be playing with these weapons, these nuclear weapons. You need that you're dealing with something you you know nothing of. You should just not not do what you're doing. Uh, and I, again, I'm just I'm just the messenger here. And um, and so they it affected everyone so much on the aircraft that these guys wanted to go out and tell tell somebody. I mean, it was that. That it, was, it affected them so so deeply, so they so they told Roy, and he says, "Well, what, what are you coming to me for?" And he said, "Well, can you help us get this out and go public with it?" And he said, "Well, I'm just you know I'm an actor on a TV show. It's it's, it's you know core fictional." And he said, "But if, if you want me to do something, I'll I'll try to help you." And he said, "Okay, well we'll get back to you." And he didn't hear from them for a couple a couple months, and then they eventually got back to him and said, "You know." We were told, uh, and this is kind of obvious, but he said we were told to keep our mouth shut, to not talk about any of this. And he says, you, you know, you're not going to hear from me anymore. And uh, I'm just, um, I've been clearly uh, given those directions. So thank you very much. But uh, uh, you'll, <laughs> that's, that's it. And Roy told me this in person, the story. So uh, there's stuff going on. I saw it myself. Um, and you're tracking it, you know, in your way. And uh, it, it, one day we're going to know about it, and I think it's going to be huge, much more uh, bigger than we ever think. I think there's that extraterrestrial aspect of things, but I, I just feel that that um, us as, as conscious beings, this goes way beyond extraterrestrial. And I, I think 
I think the way that these beings are getting here, they're so advanced that I think the development has been that they literally can travel with their mind. I, I think that's, um, I, I mean, they're, I think they're coming here at different levels, many versions, many different evolutionary periods, but I think the ones at the top can just get here by thinking it. But um, thank, thank you so much. I appreciate everything you've done. And, You're very welcome. And uh, we do appreciate the call. Um, we actually have another another caller calling in. I'll take them now. And uh, I want to follow up after this call. Uh, hang in there, caller. I want to follow up after this call about Bill Moore a little bit. Uh, caller, you're on the line. Your first name, where are you calling from? New Jersey. I'm sorry? Can you hear me? You're New on. New Jersey. What's your first name, please? My name is Joe from New Jersey. Hi, Joe. You got a comment or question for Stanton Friedman? I would just like to thank him for lending credibility to the whole subject, because most of the times when you talk about this stuff, uh, you know, you're viewed as a crackpot. And the other thing I wanted to ask him was about, uh, you know, the reason like NASA and the government don't use rockets anymore and got rid of the space shuttle, because I think that uh, he's going to answer for you thought that. They don't use it anymore because of these back-engineered UFOs that uh, they have uh, different kinds of uh, flight apparatus to go into space now. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if they've got systems we don't know about, but there are a couple of things you have to take into account. <clears throat> Advanced propulsion systems are expensive. They don't come cheap if you're going to advance the state of the art. and there, it gets much harder to hide if you've got a fleet of them, in other words. And what's the point of having them from a defense viewpoint unless you can distribute them where they're needed, hither, thither, and yon, to protect the United States, to protect us against our enemies who might want to attack us, and so forth. So <clears throat> there's a limited supply of money, uh, certain limited in the supply of imagination, too, which I've noticed that people can't imagine anybody coming here and not wanting to land on the White House lawn. <laughs> you know, and I, I think, uh, l let's say that aliens aren't stupid. It's a no-fly zone at the White House. <laughs> Hang on just one second. Uh, caller, can you turn, uh, can you mute your, your uh, computer yes, uh, in second. the background? Okay. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's all right. No, just that uh, the whole question there have already been well over a dozen PhD theses done about UFOs. Most people don't know about any of them, you know. And I get professors who say, you know, why hasn't somebody written a thesis? Well, they have. One of them was about press coverage and had some very damning statements to make about the inadequacy, the failure of the press to do its job, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there is a sophisticated literature out there if you go looking for it. In my book, uh, Top Secret Magic, which was written a number of years ago, I list, uh, I think it's 11 PhD theses done about UFOs. And people stare at me, what do you mean? Uh, they got paid? I mean, they, they, they did a thesis? Yes. One was on press coverage, which was I found very fascinating, but psychological and uh, philosophical implications and things like that. The stuff is out there, but you've got to go looking for it. It's not coming to you. Hey, thanks for the call. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. We have another one calling in. And uh, caller? Caller, welcome to the show. Your first name and where are you calling from? Welcome to the show. Where are you calling from? Your name, please. Um, obviously, there's a problem there. I see a Massachusetts number on the line. Okay, can't hear them. Um, all right, so what I wanted to ask you about, you were, you were uh, I would say you were good friends with Bill Moore at the time. You worked yes. with him. Yes. Um, so the MUFON conference in 1989, he comes out and, and, and talks about being a disinformation agent. He talks about uh, the Paul Benowitz case being involved in not a good way in that. Um, did you have any inkling that something was going on before he came out with that? Not really, but Bill, 
Bill and I are drastically different in our approach to these matters. And we had our disagreements uh, even back then. He worked hard. He, he persisted in going after people and data, you know, finding people and, and so forth. Uh, but there's no question that the field was ripe for disinformation because there's so little checking and double checking and triple checking. The Rick Doty business, that whole thing there. Uh, and there's no question that there are people in the government who are very happy to disinform, you know, to uh, keep the, the wolves at bay, so to speak, mm. by seeding the turf with false information, misleading information, and so forth. The, if, if you talk to any serious military officers from back then, you'll know that there were, what's the word I want, indoctrinations to stay away from this subject. Don't leak this information. I mean, it's obvious you don't want your officers to release the latest nuclear weapons design, for example. There's a lot of other stuff you don't want them to release either. Remember, there's something missing in this equation. Who speaks for planet Earth? You know, it's, it's easy to talk about landing on the White House lawn, but still, the president doesn't speak for the planet. That's right, yeah. That's kind there's of a nobody silly. who speaks for the planet. Yeah. Uh, we have a, the caller. Uh, sounds like there's feedback coming through. If you could mute whatever. Uh -oh. Yeah, mute whatever. You, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't have uh, nothing. Let me turn right. the volume down uh, on my headset. Yeah, because I hear, I hear a hiss. Um, huh. So I, I want to continue okay. that talk a little bit more in just a minute. Um, so sure. uh, we do have another call coming in, too. Um, so you get uh, where are you calling from, and what's your first name, please? You, you're talking to me, right? That's correct. Okay, this is Eric. I'm calling from Boston. Uh, hey, Eric. I'm actually the MUFON State Director for Massachusetts. Oh, hey, uh, welcome. Yeah. And I, I met Stan a few years ago up in Maine at the Star, uh, the Contactee Conference up in Maine. Uh, oh, yeah. It was great. Um, Stan, you mentioned uh, that uh, typically we no longer feel that we try not to think that we're the center of the universe, uh, which brings me to something that I, I have troubles with current science. Let me spout out some figures here. Um, Earth, they say, is, hold on, I got this, I got it all up, 4.5 billion years. Okay, Earth oh, is 4.5 yes. billion years. Okay, the universe, uh, they say, current science wants to say is, 13.8 billion years. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's like on the same scale there. But then when you go and you look at the Milky Way galaxy, they say that the Milky Way galaxy is 13.5 billion years ago. That's very close. That, that means it's one of the first, one of the first galaxies after the Big Bang. That's what they think. Can you see... Uh, why I have trouble with this in that I think it that the creationists are still trying to make that they, they get their way to these people that come up with these figures and it's still being we're made out to be the center of the universe it, it continues what do you, do you do you understand what I'm talking about well I, I certainly agree with you and I wonder if it isn't true all over the universe, the local galactic neighborhood, if you will, we'll tone it down a little bit from the universe. If everybody for some time until they get the truth from going out there and making better observations and so forth, I think everybody yep. will think of themselves as being of central importance. Everybody yeah, likes, <laughs> likes to think they are. And so yep. uh, I think mankind or people kind, universal kind, I don't know what else to call the residents of the universe, uh, has an ego problem. We all yes. like to think we're important. And whether you say it's Bishop Usher who said everything was created in 4004 BC, I don't know whether he said a Sunday afternoon, but you know, uh, <laughs> that's not very long ago. <laughs> When you say yeah. 13 billion years, then you say, what do we know about what happened 13 billion years ago? Damn little is all I can say, you know? Yeah. And we yeah. don't know. 
uh, people have asked me, well, why do aliens look like earthlings? I'd say maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's earthlings look like aliens because we may have been somebody's colony. Penal colony, of course. They dumped all the yeah. bad boys and girls here, and that's why we're so nasty to each other, you know. Yeah. So and there are a lot of possible. ways to look at these things. Yeah. Hey, Eric. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. How about uh, like in a year or so, you're going to get the itch, and you're going to come back out, and you're going to do a few things. What do you think? <laughs> well, I, I know that uh, next year's MUFON convention in Irvine, California, which is, I believe will be yep. in July, in 2019, yep. I will be the keynote speaker. Uh, oh, yeah. I've agreed to that. Uh, yeah, I got, I got to be alive to do that because I don't know how to breach that barrier, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I do have something on my side, genetics, if you will. Both my parents live to be 90. So Excellent, I've got yeah. six, mo six more years to go on both sides. Of, well, we you hope know. You, you're going to hit over 100. Right. That's what we hope. Yeah, over 100. You're going to do over 100, I guarantee I'll try. Hey, Eric, thanks for the call. All right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Another one coming in. All right, uh, looks like it's coming up. Hello, caller. Oh, that went away. Hung up. Okay, so the person will probably call right back. But um, So the question I had, you, were you at that uh, regarding Bill Moore? Were you actually at that MUFON event, or how soon after that did you hear about when he came out and said he was a, a did disinformation? Uh, I was there. You were there. And I was rather upset with Bill part yeah. of the time there, as you mm -hmm. can imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, it bothered me. Like I say, we have different standards, and that's not surprising. Our backgrounds are drastically different what you do for a living. As a nuclear physicist, you can't get by with opinions about most things. You gotta have facts, you got to have data. Hang on just one second. Uh, caller, you're gonna have to wait on hold and please mute your, uh, mute your computer or whatever you're listening on. Um, so, Well, just that Bill and I and, uh, and Jamie, uh, we did work together, we did work hard gathering information, collecting data, and Bill had big, they had big plans about you know, Jamie's Hollywood, and so, you know, make a big special production and, and so forth. Uh, and we had our disagreements, too, because I felt you got to stick closer to the facts. And So I've always liked about you. Well, thank you. Well, I'd, I'd be untrue to myself and to being the professional organizations to which I work, uh, to which I belong, uh, if I wasn't concerned about facts first mm -hmm. and opinions later. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the way things are. When you work for GE or Westinghouse or one of these outfits, uh, they don't want bologna. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> or meatloaf, uh, <laughs> you know, they want steak. Yeah. <laughs> first cut. <laughs> right, right. Uh, caller, you're on the line now. Your first name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name's Kevin, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Stan's old stomping grounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Uh, Hi, Stan. Hey, I just bought one of your books off your website. I have to tell you, I've, you know, I've been waiting a while, and I figured tonight's the night to start getting it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Uh, the more people who buy the books, the faster they go flowing. And uh, the point, you know, books, people think authors make a ton of money, and, and there are some who do. But I, I'm not one of them. You know, royalties aren't that <laughs> great. I make more money selling the books that I can buy at a very good discount from the publisher, my publisher. Really? He's good to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I carry books around. Well, I ship books ahead and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I, I just want I just wanted to start adding to my collection. I, I loved your work, and I've always loved your work. And thank you so much for all you've done. I just have one quick question for you. Sure. Out of, out of all of your years in this, in this field and your studying and who you've interviewed and, and everything that goes along with it, can you tell us maybe what is your biggest disappointment or who has been your biggest disappointment? And you don't have to mention names, but I just wanted to know, you know, what has really sometimes maybe turned you off to all this? Well, uh, there are some people who have climbed the heights of ufology, if you will, and featured at conferences and stuff that I find are not being scientific or careful or 
with what they say and how they describe it. We don't go for the evidence. They go for the research by proclamation, which I find unacceptable just because of my background. I could never have gotten away with that kind of stuff when I was working as a physicist. Uh, that, that's probably, and also, I, I guess I was an optimist and I was hoping that the, the lid would be blown off the cosmic water gate by now, you know, so that I could relax and say, told you so. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't seen well, that hey, happen. Well, uh, you know. Well, I think, I, think you've pried, I think you've pried the lid off a little bit. I have to say that. Well, I've tried with Roswell in particular. Uh, and I get a real kick out of the people's reaction when I show blacked out documents and whited out documents. Uh, if people say, what's he talking about? Well, the National Security Agency, the NSA, or no such agency as some people say, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> when we used the Freedom of Information Act, we, we went after them for their UFO stuff. This is years ago. And uh, they, they really gave us nothing, but they had found uh, 156 top secret Umbra UFO documents. And we finally got copies of some of these things. They're all whited out. You could read one sentence mm. per page. One sentence per page. And <laughs> you can't read what's under the white out because you're getting a Xerox of it. You know, you're not getting the originals. And so mm -hmm. I, I, that was a disappointment, but it's certainly proof. Uh, the same happens with the CIA, incidentally. We, we got 800 pages of material through secret. And I later got a few dozen pages of top secret material, but you know you could read ten words on some of the pages if you were lucky, you know. So and right. and then when I get people tell me, oh, the government can't keep secrets, I say, do you know what's under this blacked out stuff? You know. <laughs> so the data is there, and you know, it, it's hard to gather all this stuff and put it out. Publishers aren't interested in, in informing the public. They're interested in publishing books and making money. Nothing against my publisher. He's always been cooperative, and they've always gotten the books where they were supposed to be, when they were supposed to be there, and stuff like that. But processing the truth is, is not the goal of publishing a book from the publisher's viewpoint. What good is a book if you can't sell it? It costs you money to print it. And you got to pay the author something, not a lot. <laughs> uh, so it's been disheartening well, sometimes. Anyway, hey, Martin, I, Stan, thank you so much. I'll get off and let somebody else call. Hey, Martin, thank you so much. Great show. And Stan, thank you so much for all these years of just, just keeping our minds moving. Thank you so much. Thank all you. right, Kevin, thanks for the call. Um, the lines See you later. Yeah, bye now. Lines open. Someone can call in if they'd like. Um, Stan, uh, and we may get interrupted again, but... You were telling me at some point before we got a call and kind of stopped talking about it, why you were disappointed in To the Stars with what the, and we have a call coming in. <laughs> I will try to get to that. So this is the last call actually I'm going to take. Uh, we, have, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and let's see it come up. Uh, caller, you're on the line. Your first name and where are you calling from? This is Ron from South Carolina. Hey, Ron. Going to be in South Carolina. All right. Yeah, you're going to be down in Columbia, right? Yes, that's right. Capital of the state of South Carolina. Is that drenched? Uh, was it that was, way? but I've checked, and they're not flooded out. Well, it's good to know. I was worried I'd have to cancel the trip because I have to float there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this caller is our resident skeptic. Oh. Yeah. So, but uh, I, I don't suppose you have a lot of skeptical things to say to Stan, do you, this time? No, no. In fact, uh, the first thing I want to say is I do, even as a skeptic, I really appreciate all the hard work he has devoted to this over the years. I am old enough to remember what research was like before there were search engines and, and Internet searches and that sort of thing. You really had to really get in there and do the work, and I do appreciate that. And uh, I do I also have a question. Um, sure. I wanted, I wanted to ask him, uh, uh, with MJ-12, and that's a subject that has not come up this evening, I just wanted to You're ask You're right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. 
I wanted to ask him uh, when he first got when they first saw the documents. He was a little skeptical because Donald Menzel's name was on them, and I just wanted to ask him uh, what what was the one thing, or was it just a preponderance of the evidence that made him think it was the real deal? Well. Donald Menzel was a Harvard University astronomer, a very well-known astronomer, and he'd written three anti-UFO books. And so when we get these, the MJ-12 documents, and it shows him as one of the members of this incredibly secret group, Majestic 12, your first thought is, oh, that's baloney. Menzel couldn't have been a part of such a group. But I had to get permission from three different people to look at his papers at Harvard, uh, they couldn't just walk in off the street, in other words. They were at the archives there. And was shocked, frankly, pleased I must say, but shocked to find uh, he was in touch with Jack Kennedy. And it was, Menzel had a longer continuous association with uh, high classified material, with the NSC, NSA, all these guys. Uh, than anybody, more than 30 years. And I, I was shocked by that, that he, he wrote uh, to somebody that when we're properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. He, he was a cryptologist, code breaker, code maker. Nobody knew that. I mean, and I talked to families of all the 12 members, uh, except one, some I couldn't find, I think, I don't know, the family was gone or whatever it was. But Menzel was the biggest surprise. Everybody asked me what was the biggest surprise in my UFO research. It was finding Menzel's name on that list and then being able to uh, prove that he had clearances, that he did all kinds of classified work and so forth. Uh, that was a shocker. But I did the homework. It, it took a lot of effort. I mean, and the people who say, you know, Menzel couldn't have led a double life. Well, I would like to point out the three names, Philby, Burgess, and McLean. These were Russian spies who worked in British intelligence. Uh, you know, you can keep secrets, and you can be inside an organization that is working on the opposite side from where you are. And they did, those were just three names. There, I'm sure there were many others, uh, you know, on both sides of the Iron Curtain. But... Uh, Menzel was a shock, and I did talk to his wife. I did talk to one of his children. Uh, I was very impressed. I became a fan of Donald Menzel. I had one phone conversation with him early on, and uh, he said to me, you can't be a scientist and believe in flying saucers, and I laughed, and he got angry. <laughs> <laughs> wow, amazing. All right, Ryan, hey, thanks for the call. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Um, so we had someone, uh, we're not, um, if someone wants to call, someone's been trying to call in, if they want to call back one more time, just for a quick one, um, then uh, a quick comment or whatever, then uh, call now or forever hold the dial or whatever it is. <laughs> but um, so we were talking about, uh, I'm not seeing that call coming in, so we're talking about why you were disappointed and uh, I don't want to end on a negative note. We only have uh, a few minutes left here. But why were you disappointed in To the Stars? Because there's not a lot going on? Well, yeah, let me make one comment. Sure. Uh, the other shoe, I've been waiting for the shoe to drop uh -huh. for seven months. Yes. It sounded so promising. I was so impressed with the people. And yet we haven't had, there had to be reports written. We haven't seen any of them. Now, whether that just means somebody's being stubborn about declassifying, uh, I, I, that's probably the most logical reaction. But still, that was the disappointment that I thought the ball was rolling and it stopped. Yeah, yeah. All right, Stan, so we have two minutes left. Um, I want, if you would, tell me what's been the best thing about this for you. I'm sorry we're not going to be taking any more calls at this point. What's been the best part of ufology for you? The opportunity to talk to a lot of people in a lot of places who were sharp people and who had bits and pieces to tell me that, you know, it would be easy to think, well, Friedman's the only one who thinks the way he does or has reached the conclusions he has. Well, I know that's not true uh, because I've talked to so many people in so many places, all 50 states, 10 provinces, 19 other countries, 
and I have a question and answer period after every lecture, and I do lots of radio shows like this one, and you know, television shows and so forth. Uh, and so, uh, I am disappointed that we haven't gotten farther. I, I will say that, because I was hoping that during my lifetime the truth would be exposed and mankind would start to realize that earthlings are not unique, they're not as important as they'd like to think they are, and maybe we can join the Galactic Federation sometime, I hope. <laughs> and uh, one last uh, quick question, we have one minute left. Uh, what's some advice that you would give um, someone that's coming into the UFO field now? Um, the biggest thing is do your homework. There, look, I've got a 10-page reference list at the end of Top Secret Magic, and uh, I've got almost much in Flying Saucers and Science. There's a lot of stuff out there. There are scholarly works. There are large-scale scientific studies that most people are totally unaware of. So if you want to get steeped in the facts, they're there, but you've got to look for them. I'm yeah. sorry, Blue Book Special Report 14 has data on 3,201 sightings. Most people have never heard of it. That's really amazing. Uh, Stan, I want to thank you personally so much um, for all that you have, um, you've given to the field, and uh, it's been such an honor to talk to you. And one of the things I've always liked about you is you're approachable, and you make yourself approachable at any event, and also even on your website you give information, which is kind of daring. I don't even do that. So anyway. You mean how they can reach me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thanks so much. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate it's been my pleasure. Go to stantonfriedman.com and get the scoop. Yep, it's all there. And all right, everyone, so that's it for the show. Next week we'll be back with Joseph Burks. And uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. And remember, you keep your eyes to the sky.